communication. My name is Luis Marcelo Mendez. I work on the uh, Roberto Mariño's communications uh, department. We are currently building two museums in the city of Rio de Janeiro for the Olympics to be held next year in this city. One of these museums is the one that is uh, depicted in this screen, and this is the image and sound museum in the Copacabana Beach. A uh, very far-reaching uh, architectural project. And I invite you and encourage you to come next year to Rio de Janeiro. During my spare time, I um, prepare these type of books that are actually in the second edition. And the story about this book uh, describes my introduction into the world of museums. And my journey started back uh, when I uh, found out or came across uh, Robert Jones' uh, text, that is, Ward Fallings, one of the leading brand consulting firms. This statement by Robert Jones caught my attention because it made reference not only to uh, the relationship between uh, braiding and management and uh, museum universe. There is a long misunderstanding and a struggle between these two entities. And I was thinking about this as well as um, the information on data. We always are interested in reading data, and he gathers information from data. And he held a conference in 2008 with 100 museum consultants. And he collected very interesting information about uh, museum brands. Uh, so I envied him a lot, and I decided to um, delve into the uh, research uh, last year. I carried out a second research with a broader universe, uh, including an online research. The sampling was broader, and I screened out the findings. The global exposure was global, actually, more interesting in terms of hierarchies, gender, backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, and it was very, very interesting. What caught my attention was uh, the consistency uh, found in the research compared to the 2008 research. The similarity, the consistency in the findings. I will share with you some of the findings, some topics that are interesting in terms of communication and what museums communicate. The first piece of information that is very interesting how museum staff would describe the current situation of their museums. And we see that 41% of respondents say that their museums um, potentially were not um, heavily visited. So 41% of the, uh, the answers show that respondents uh, said, well, respondents, so the question was, do you understand or do you know the brand of the museum? Almost 50% said that they were not familiar with the brand of the museum. And that is a piece of concern in terms of communication as well as a, a, a more in-depth 
uh, discussion with regard to museum staff's mission. But now, out of the 41 percent identifying uh, museums as huge potential, but not very frequently visited, we see a relationship with the fact that museums don't have a well-defined brand, and that relationship stands out clearer. And when we asked, what does your museum think in terms of brand management? How do they behave in terms of their brand management strategy? We observe that 22 percent uh, consider that the relationship with the brand is associated to a visual application. Another 22 percent identifies that is limited to the marketing department, and there is not a significant relationship with that. And only 25 percent understand that the brand is something that guides all the things carried out by the museum. And this is the funniest part of the story, of this story. As Robert Johnson's research, I asked, I asked respondents, um, which are the most admired museum brands for you? And there were some uh, significant differences in the answers. There were three fields, including three museum possibilities and some preferences. And I will share the outcome. Which one, in your opinion, is the most admired museum brand. MoMA? The MoMA, whatever I asked this uh, question, is the top brand, the most admired brand. And it's always uh, it's ranked first in the ranking. And also, in the first box to tick. And the second most um, admired, memorable brand, again, the answer is the typical Tate, the Tate Gallery second. BA, and there is a technical um, draw between the Metropolitan and this museum. This museum has been closed for almost 10 years, but when it was reopened in uh, 2013, uh, it gained a uh, brand value, the Rich Museum. I'm talking about the Rich Museum. And this is another research carried out last year. So if we are so fond and we admire so much this brand, why are we so reluctant to branding? Branding is a concept uh, broadly used in the corporate world. But having said that, let's understand branding in a more, uh, in a broader fashion. Following Stephen Whale's statement, and I quote, if we think in terms of success, the reason of success, we see that this is tied to a different definition of branding. And I quote again Jean-Luc Godard and José Nun, art is not culture. Culture is the rule, and art is the exception to the rule. And although we are involved in art museums, we know that we are part of the culture. Uh, artists are responsible for the art, but we generate and build culture. Branding is uh, culture, and culture is branding. So my proposal to you is this. What does the Malba do? What makes Malba the Malba Museum? What makes the Tate Museum the Tate Museum? And the MoMA the MoMA Museum? We are a dream, excellent team. We can discuss, we can think together, we can share knowledge. 
and thank you very much for sharing this round table with me. Yo soy Guadalupe Requena, eh, soy la coordinadora de comunicación de Malva, justamente, y eh, tengo el privilegio en un punto de Good trabajar morning. en el museo. I have the honor to work in, at the Malva Museum for 12 years now, and I have seen the transformation that the communications unit of the museum went through. This is why I wanted to echo on what Luis said and to, be, to talk about the strength of the museum. Ever since its inception, in September 2001, we were focused on branding, right? Malva is the brand, Latin American Museum of Arts. It has always been a strong brand from the very beginning. The museum was created to host the collection of the founder and the decision not to name the museum after the founder was a very good decision. Another strength is the location. It is located in, in one of the main avenues of Buenos Aires. It's one of the first buildings in Argentina built for the specific purpose of hosting or housing a museum, a very important collection of Latin American art here we can see Frida, Tarsila, and a program of exhibitions and public programs that was very strong from the beginning. So the many different public activities are held. This is a cinema program, one of the most important in the or in the movie theaters in the city. After positioning itself as a museum, there's also a positioning in terms of identity. What is the voice of the museum? What is the tone? What's the relationship with the community? Last year, we decided to transform our visual identity. And we had an institutional mission, and that is to depersonalize the museum and start thinking about its sustainability in time. Since this has to be a contemporary museum detached from its founder, the most important topic in relation to its identity is that, well, we do admire MoMA and Tate, but MoMA has to also be engaged in the international dialogue, but it is in, embedded in the Latin American setting. We only have two persons dedicated to communications, press, identity, web, social media. So sometimes they are facing major challenges. Uh, when compared to other teams of communications of other museums that are made up of 30 persons, for example. But it, our branding has allowed us to have a placement in the international sphere, but also to be strong in the local arena. Another issue that was mentioned during the trial is that museum is the medium. Before, we used to work based on media and press. The media were the intermediary between the museum and the public or the audience. When museums were conceived as a multi-platform medium, we started having a very fluid relationship with a more active and demanding community that demands from the museum a certain feedback and a role and certain contents and high level of quality. What are the challenges? with this conception to not only disseminate information, not uh, engage in self-boasting, and start creating independent contents. It also implies being in constant contact with what is happening. This is why we work our website with WordPress. We work with different formats. We're very strong in visual arts. 
and so if other museums have online pictures, well, we may do too. We generate space for people's participation and for people to mirror what they saw. In 2003, we had a major uh, exhibition of Shakoi Kusama, and we changed the approach. Each visitor has a story to tell, and those stories can be seen at the museum. Maria Shatomi, an 84-year-old, came to the museum. She hadn't been to the museum. She took two, three buses to come to the museum. She was queuing under the rain. And Gala Quebrada, this is a character that came every week, impersonated, as you can see, him on the screen. And he adored Kusama. So uh, stories do not only stem from the museum, but also from the participants. They are co-authors of the contents. And we contain the content created by visitors. I understand in this panel that we already know where a museum is embedded or inserted. It's inserted in leisure or enjoyment. We compete against theater, a swimming pool, football, soccer. So how can we make our current audience loyal? How can we work with large audiences? How can we promote participation? We can discuss for three days on whether this the street salesperson is part of the entertaining or not. At least during the Shakoi Kusama's exhibition, this salesperson was there every single day. And we need to offer different levels of interpretation of the content produced by the museum. This commitment has to change the whole organization. The organization crosses through the whole museum. But communication is not just about finding commitment from the communications area, but also the whole team has to be committed. In that sense, we need to give that position. Sometimes it's very difficult for us to delegate. There is a control issue going on. But we need to echo on the co-authoring and plurality idea. And we need to replicate that within the museum and also towards our virtual and physical visitors. Is that fine, right? So if we're talking about branding, here's my branding. It's my name. It wasn't the most clever thing that I've ever done, but it works. Many times when I say to people, hi, I'm R. Dixon, or if they ask for my name, they don't know that that's a first and last name because they associate that with the brand of social media and things that I do online. I call myself an advocacy and a troublemaker depending upon what side of the fence you're on. All right? So management usually sees me as a troublemaker. Public usually sees me as an advocate. I'm going to be very brief here because I can talk for hours on this, and I know that we got two more to speak. So I've got two slides. This is a motto that I go by, and I encourage most people to go by this. It's always easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, because when you ask for permission, by the time you get it, the idea is already corrupted. So if you do it, they usually don't even recognize that you're doing it and talking about communication and social media and branding type things. Boards of directors and trustees, and, and they're so busy, the small stuff that we're trying to do that makes big differences, they really don't need to know about. You can do it on your own, and then if they find out about it, and as long as you're doing it with great intentions, they're really not going to do anything. The worst they'll do is maybe smack your hand. But we're adults, and you hope that they don't do that. My second slide is very important also. And this is another motto that I go by. And it's listen to what your public and your communities are saying. Understand their needs and what you can do to fulfill them and act on it. Action is the most important thing out of all this. We can go around and talk. We can put sticky notes out, we can write things down, but unless we actually act upon these decisions, we're gonna get nowhere. 
Real quickly, I'm just going to say some of the stuff that I do on social media is uh, Museum Selfie Day, Ask a Curator Day, which is coming up on September 16th. They are all not from my own ideas. They are from the public saying that they want to do something in a museum and they don't know what to do. Museum Selfie Day has gone world trending twice already. And that's because I'm giving a forum and I'm making museums change that don't work for in museums. Museums have to change when I'm doing these hashtags. A lot of museums didn't allow photography in their museum before Museum Selfie Day, but they saw that it was a good reason for them to, to, to open up their doors for that. It's small things like this. We do not have to be changing all the mission statements. We do not have to be changing policies. We can make small little steps that make huge differences to the public who then become your advocates. Okay? I'm going to end there, and you guys can ask me questions later. That's short and sweet. <laughs> I'm Margot Lopez. I work at the museum, Bio Museum or Bio Museo. This, we are working on a project that took us a long time to develop. The purpose of our museum was to work with the Panamanian community to have them take pride. In, their, in themselves and for them to learn about the importance of their natural museum. If this didn't happen, we were in the track to lose most of our biodiversity. It is with this purpose that we decided to create an agent of change to change society from the beginning. The project got started. Frank Gehry, the architect, was invited to work on this. He's married to a Panamanian girl, so he knows our society. And Frank Gehry also invited Bruce Mob to work on the project, one of the things that was very important to us from the very beginning. And Frank, the first thing that he said to us is that I don't believe in designer buildings. I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in having people come take a picture of uh, the building from the outside and uh, without having any idea of what's happening on the inside. This is how this work was born. It's a, a tremendously collaborative project. Lots of people got involved. There were lots of discussions, Panamanian scientists. And through the Smithsonian, which is 100 years old in Panama, we did research. And the museum was created precisely to become a communication tool to the public. Engineers, architects, designers started to put together the story about the formation of the Panama Isthmus and how this changed the natural world in which we live today. The last gallery of the museum is called Panama is the Museum. So when you tour the museum, at the end of your tour, you should have changed your way of relating to nature. The image that you can see there is how the museum can be viewed with many colors from every point of the city. And a strategy which comes from nature is to call people's attention so that people f feel attracted and they want to go to the museum. At the museum, most of the experiences are basically emotional. We are worried about sometimes when uh, other centers are so concerned about the environment that people get tired of listening to those concerns. What we're trying to do, on the other hand, is to have people fall in love with nature again. There are no doors, there are no windows in the museum. And you can go from one place to the other, working, uh, walking in outdoor halls. This picture was taken during the night, unfortunately. But during the day, you will see the colors of nature blending in. The museum has many lines that force you to look outwards. And 
it forces you to see how external elements have an influence on the museum. This is Bruce Mao. One of the things that we did in relation to selfies is that in Instagram, we realize that people do not know how to take pictures of buildings. We are many architects working together. So we said, well, we should teach people how to take pictures of buildings. So we decided to place this sticker. And if you stand on it, the picture will be spectacular. But if you look, if you placed this stickers at some places, you were also going to learn things that the building was telling you about biodiversity. People didn't discover it on their own, but they did discover it when they had their selfie taken. So people took the selfie and turned around to see what's on, what was on the background. They were realizing about something that they wouldn't have seen without a selfie photograph. These things that seem to be superficial sometimes are not. Another idea was to generate a mixture of things that are going on in the museum. You can touch the museum, you can jump, you can interact with the museum. And let me tell you a little bit about Panama is the museum, the last gallery of the museum. And it's there to tell you that what you're seeing at the museum, it's just a representation that the true museum is outside. And your visit gets started when you exit the building. The building is a tool, a device to make you change your mindset. But that's the message that you should take away with you. And we're trying to learn from this first drill, this exercise of working in collaboration, the result of which was this building. But we keep learning how to work together and things that we can put together. And we are experimenting because we realize that we are missing things. It is not just about the building. The experience begins before visitors come and it continues, it expands after visitors leave the building. So thanks to technology, we can also interact with people that will never even set a foot on the building. So there are many ways to interact with the museum and million, millions of ways to see and to, to make our vision happen and for us to communicate it. The building and the visit is just one, but there are many more. Good morning, my name is Robert Stein. I'm the deputy director of the Dallas Museum of Art. Uh, thank you very much for having me in Buenos Aires. Thank you to my colleagues on the panel who have been terrific this morning. And I, I hope that you'll be writing down some great questions to ask us soon. I wanted to tell you a little bit about Dallas and about my museum, the work that we do there. Uh, Dallas, uh, as you may be familiar, is in the south of the United States. It's a, a very large metropolitan area of about seven million people. Uh, it's growing faster than any other city in the United States. So it's growing very, very quickly. Uh, and the city is really very interesting. In some ways, it's um, very uh, typically American, uh, but it's also very cosmopolitan. People move in and out of Dallas uh, very frequently, and the city is very wealthy on one hand, but in fact, most of the people in Dallas are very poor. Um, Dallas itself is not known as a center of art and culture. Uh, we have very little in the way of tourism, uh, except for the Dallas Cowboys and maybe a TV show. <laughs> So uh, my Museum of Art is in this uh, position where uh, we are the, the, the art museum, uh, the major art museum in the city. We're the largest cultural organization uh, in the region with, within about six hours. Uh, this is a look at the museum uh, from above. It, and we're also connected directly downtown. So we're right in the heart of uh, what makes Dallas a, a city. Uh, we're also a part of um, what has become the, the largest arts district in, in the United States. It's about 70 acres large, the, 
art museum is on one side, but it is also part with a, a smaller a sculpture center called the Nasher Sculpture Center, uh, a museum of Asian art, a symphony, an opera, a theater, a performing art, and a high school, um, all within one connected district. So we work together with, uh, with each other to try to bring uh, a vibrant cultural atmosphere to the city of Dallas. So when I joined uh, the museum about three years ago, we uh, approached this position in the city and we asked ourselves, what does it really mean if we were going to be the city's museum? If the Dallas Museum of Art was going to belong to everyone in the city, whether they already knew that they liked art or whether they never knew that art was for them. And uh, it's caused us to think about our brand. Uh, we've talked a lot about brand this morning and I'll confess to not uh, being a marketing professional. So when we talk about brand, I need to make it very, very simple. Uh, and I thought that between Texas, we love steak, and Argentina, uh, Argentina loves steak, and so branding is the mark on a cattle, you know, is a great, uh, is a great way to think about this. Um, and more so, uh, you know, in Dallas, we think about branding like, uh, like our personal character. What does it mean to be a person? So my simple way of thinking about branding, and we'll just cover five points, uh, the short, is uh, if you think about your brand as what it means to be a great friend, uh, someone who you love to be around, who is your champion, your mentor, who teaches you things, but who's also fun to be with. If you can think about your brand in that way. Uh, at our museum, we really wanted to center our brand around the idea of freedom. Uh, partially because we, we um, made the museum free. We dropped our admission charge, so it costs nothing for people to come to the museum, but also we want the museum to be free for people to explore, explore something they've never learned before, free to have opinions that are different, um, free to speak out about something that's unpopular. So we're expanding that idea. So for you, I thought uh, we'd just talk about five ways to think about your brand. And again, put on this idea of your brand as a person or a friend. Um, so the first point is really to be real. Um, the public already knows that we're not perfect. And so it's OK to, to share about how the museum itself is learning. Uh, and if we expect our uh, visitors to learn when they're in the museum, they want to know that we're also learning. So it's not, we don't have to get everything right all at the very first time. Uh, when we do, everybody thinks we're too perfect and they, they don't believe us. It doesn't seem authentic or real. The second is to be open, to be open to new ideas, to be open to someone who might challenge you and not think that you're uh, all that you claim to be. Uh, be open that people won't like you. That's okay, not everyone has to like everything that we do. Uh, and this one, be different. Um, be something that's not already present. I think one of our complaints and problems about museums is that in some ways uh, we like to say that every museum is unique, but we all want to be the same. So don't be afraid to be different. Don't be afraid to do something that's never been done before. And as long as you're real about it, uh, you can change. It connects to this next idea is be wrong. Uh, if you're not wrong uh, at some point in time, you're not trying hard enough. Uh, you're not experimenting, you're not out far enough. And the public wants to know that you've tried something that didn't work uh, and you changed. So that when you try something that does work, then they believe you. If you never fail at anything, you know, no real person ever is completely perfect and never fails, so be wrong. Uh, and the last point, is really that you should be building, right? Uh, if we're learning, if we're trying new things, if we're succeeding and we're failing, we ought to be building and learning and growing. Uh, so have a very strategic idea about who you are as a person. It's just like uh, you as a professional. Many of you are very strategic about your career, right? You think I'll go to school, I'll have this degree, I'll work in this place, and then I'll go. So you have an idea. Your museum needs to have an idea about what it will be tomorrow uh, that it isn't already today. So I hope that this is a clear way to think about branding. It's very personal, it's very simple. If you just test your museum brand against what it would be like to be friends with your museum, that's a great way to start. So thank you very much. <laughs> Oh.
Então, só, é, eu imagino que é, a nossa plateia deve estar cheia de perguntas. Eu vou pedir já para vocês levantarem a mão e os... Eu acho que provavelmente há muitas perguntas, então, por favor, levantem suas mãos. Enquanto isso, eu vou fazer uma pergunta. E esperar para o microfone. Que... And meanwhile, I ask a question to the group myself. Fortunately, we have two great museum thinkers here today. Robert Stein is here with us, and David Henderson. And he, during a conference of museums in the United Kingdom last year, he said that museums are essential for societies. There was a whole debate around it. There's a brilliant text or writing that sees the other face to it. And it says, well, yes, we are essential, but we have a great problem. And that is that we need to show evidence of our critical contribution to society. And here's my question. In what way the communications of the strate strategic branding management can contribute to this perspective of becoming that critical contribution to society, or how can we provide evidence about it? I don't know about the evidence, but I think one thing that we've discussed quite a lot is about them recognizing the shift in their what the public's perceiving them as and, and changing with how the public is going. So the key thing is, you know, it used to be known as academic, it has to be academic, it has to be research, it has to be this, and now it's, we're seeing the shift to emotive and emotions and letting people feel the way they want to feel and being real and doing the things that they want to do. And I don't know if it's quantitative and I don't know if you can get data on that, although we talked about the Happy Museum and, and things like that, that might be possible, but I think the paradigm shift that's happening, if museums stop being, no, we can't do this because this is the way we've always done it, and move with the way the society's going, be, they'll, they'll be more loved. I mean, I happen to be one who believes that uh, as museums, we do a very poor job of communicating how much we do matter. Um, I think in the room, we all believe it, and we know this, uh, and we feel it in our hearts, but we don't do a good job of providing data and information, and we don't write about it. Uh, we don't participate in the same way that maybe business or healthcare does. Uh, and so when it comes to the choice of a, a, a policymaker or a decision maker, they're faced with a the decision. They don't know maybe arts and culture, and so they have data about healthcare, they have data about education, and data about, about business, and from the arts and culture, they have great stories. Yeah. So and this just doesn't work. Um, so I believe that it is possible to put data behind why museums matter and the stories that we can tell and how people's lives are changed. I believe that. And I think it may be that we just have to get more creative uh, about the way that we document the impacts that the museums are having. But I think we do a very poor job of communicating why we matter. Primeira pergunta da mesa, eu só vou pedir para vocês perguntas curtas e objetivas. Elas têm mais possibilidades de vencer na piscina genética das perguntas. Vamos lá. Uma pergunta pode ser? Vamos lá. A pergunta é se nos podem dar algum conselho para os museus em los quais não há uma pessoa de prensa encargada e a prensa se o branding, prensa, comunicação. What about, for example, when museums do not have branding, communication? How do you approach that way? Well, as I said in my presentation, communication crisscrosses museum staff and management, the idea of the press or the media that is so powerful as a paradigm, or the idea that the program is not successful and it failed because it was not well um, publicized or communicated. Uh, it's something that goes back to the 70s. Communication is done by everybody with each visitor. Each visitor is a spokesperson of the um, museum. So we have 
to uh, give that power or grant that power to the visitor. It's our duty, but using our own channels, the museum channels. The museum is the container and should give visibility to that multiplicity of voices. There is no one single person in charge of the communication. The museum is done by any museum visitor and that communicates through any social media, etc., etc. So we are all the museum. We need to convey or pass on that idea. Another thing, I don't know whether this is customary, but in our museum, we it's kind of a schizophrenia because we do all things. At some point, the museum staff must be involved in that mission, must be embarked, and they should be able to uh, do everything. Uh, as is Lupe's case, we are just two people in the communication uh, department. Sometimes we get two, three journalists, and I cannot um, interview them, and there is nobody to see them. But I can tell the guards to talk with the journalist, and they will be uh, amazed because they will share the same vision, the same vision that I can share with them. And that is our purpose in the museums. And when we, the museum is very crowded and there are not enough uh, guides, and this, uh, the security guards are guides, the cleaning staff can also tell the story or can become guides. And this is like having a uh, 60 people communications department like social media or you don't have the communication people to do it create it yourself this is this goes back to ask forgiveness rather than permission just do it yourself and i can tell you there's so many national museums <laughs> who have done that and natural history museum um twitter account started with the fundraising person she got in trouble afterwards because they were like no 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 that should be somebody else but nobody was doing it so do it and then get involved in it, show that it's good, and, you know, it, it's, it's not a bad thing, but why not you be the person? Eh, no sé si el museo está abierto en esos horarios de noche, pero al ejemplo de Panamá, donde su museo es abierto en contacto con la naturaleza, porque es lo que muestra, eh, digo, en un museo como Dallas, ¿cómo atrae el público sin caer en una banalización de la cultura o una espectacularización del, del arte? <risa> Thank you. Good, very good question. No, you're correct, Dallas. Uh, audiences in Dallas uh, had not really known about the museum when we arrived. So while the city was growing faster than any other city in America, the attendance at the art museum was staying flat at about 485,000. And it had been that way for the past 10 years. So we really asked, you know, what could we do to, to change this? And uh, there, were, there were three things that we really did to do that. The first we already talked about, we eliminated our charge for admission. As we looked at the budget of the museum, so many times decisions of principle come down to money. Um, but uh, when we looked at that, the, the admission fee was only about 3% of our revenues. So we decided it was more important to get people to come first before we worried about the money second. So we eliminated admission. This uh, immediately was a, something that we could talk about and we could celebrate and we threw a party. We told everyone that it was free. We wanted them to come. The second thing, and I'm so glad Margot mentioned about using your staff, uh, your, your front of house staff as uh, advocates for the museum's brand and message. So we did the same. We uh, trained all of our security guards. Um, there's about 100 of them, and all of our uh, custodial staff or janitors uh, to be ambassadors for the city. So they uh, represent every type of person in Dallas, and we made sure that they understood that 
our director's office wants everybody in the city to come. And we sort of deputized them. We gave them the responsibility for being welcoming, to tell their friends, to tell their family. And that, that connects into the third point, was we really used grassroots um, message, so word of mouth, uh, to make sure that everyone who showed up had an experience where they felt absolutely wanted to be at the museum, that the museum wanted them to be there, and that it was their opportunity to go and tell their neighbor that we also want their neighbor. Uh, so we used um, social media extensively to do this, um, but really to involve what the visitors say about the museum in our own social media branding. It's a very traditional approach by now. Um, and we also extended an invitation to join the museum for free as a member. So we have a program that we call Friends, um, which is about participation. So we give people rewards for doing more things with us, and it's, it's a third leg that we try to ensure. Mostly it all boils down to the fact that we want everyone in Dallas to know that they're wanted by the museum. So it had to result is increased attendance by 50% in two years. Uh, we have increased uh, minority participation in the museum by 30%. Uh, and we have about 40% of our overall audience now tell us that they're first time visitors. So they're people who've lived in the city who've never come before and now four out of 10 are coming for the first time. So that tells me that it's working. Thank you for your question. <coughs> Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> ah, sensitive. <laughs> Le quería hacer una pregunta a Robert Stein, pero me parece que un poco la estaba desarrollando. Yo quería, tenía una duda y me gustaría que me amplíe un poco. ¿A qué le llaman en un museo de arte ser diferente? Eh, creo que más o menos lo estabas desarrollando hace un segundo. Indifference. Oh, okay, thank you. I understand now. Um, so, what does it mean to be different as a museum? I, I think, especially as an art museum, uh, there's a very classic experience with an art museum, and the public has an idea about what this means to visit. And oftentimes, it it they expect that we have a white box that we hang paintings on the wall, and they're expected to stand quietly with their hands behind their back uh, and I walk through the center of the gallery and not talk to anyone. This is the stereotype about visiting an art museum. And it's, you know, for many people, it's not very fun. Uh, so to do things that uh, are counter to that experience, to, we, we talked about our security guards, we encourage them to start conversations and we, we teach them about how to ask good questions. Uh, so it's a very different experience when you walk into a gallery and we're welcoming you to bring your child with you, and we're giving you questions to ask and telling you how to talk about things. The gallery doesn't feel quiet. Um, I think, to you know, as a museum, to give, especially as an art museum, to give permission for the visitor not to like what they see. Uh, that not everyone has to like every type of art. Uh, and that's different. We, as art museums, we don't talk about that. But now uh, when somebody, hears you say that, it's surprising to them and it makes them question like, okay, why is, why is this man telling me that I don't have to like what they put on display? Uh, but, it, you know, it creates an opportunity and a, and a time to talk, so. Things that can be surprising and at the same time genuine are, are really, really important. Hey, hola. Hello, I asked a question yesterday in one of the other um, panels and you've already answered it. And yesterday we didn't have enough time for many questions. I think that you built on what was yesterday's panels. And I would like to ask you about the interdisciplinary or cross-functional work. Any comments about cross-functional work? So, I mentioned, yes, I will expand on this, um, the way we work and how we started to work in the Bio Museo, Bio Museum. I think that there are very few museums that uh, started from scratch this way. In our particular case, 
there was an urgent need. People should take ownership of their natural uh, legacy. And that's something that is uh, an urgency all over the world. But as Panama is located in a very strategic point, education does not take that into account. The museum tells the story of Panama that is not told in schools. So it was about the possibility of creating or generating pride in the uh, population. So we hired engage uh, Bruce Mall Services and he collected all possible stories about Panama and uh, contacted Panamanian scientists both within Panama and outside Panama and we summarized that information that is like a creation myths about Panama but is uh, science based and the possibility of uh, transferring that power. When we started with the first sketches and in that design panel, we got together the geologist carrying out the um, investigation about the creation of uh, the Panama Isthmus and also the landscape designer, the engineers, because the structure itself speaks volumes of the biodiversity in Panama and their role or their task was um, to take on when the other person's uh, task um, ended. And there was no distinction between the science and the building itself. So this type of uh, partnership work was within the team itself. So interpretation is not just about the interpretation or having a script and that you should learn, but actually it's built by everybody. Sometimes we uh, hold workshops and the janitors are there or participate because we are all part of that pride or of that story that we are telling and we should raise voices of all uh, the different levels. It's very gratifying to see uh, the creativity that we can generate when everybody or whatever we say or think is valid and ideas flow in a wonderful way. I think that it's a great fashion or way for any person to be that is in contact with that space be able to uh, be part of this story. Other questions? Any other questions? Yes. Um, buenos dias. Uh, Branding, I think, is a great opportunity to reestablish who you are and what you want to say, uh, who you are to the public. Um, as designers, when we're involved in renewal projects, we often say to the museums, this is a fantastic opportunity to rebrand. Uh, but there's huge reluctance because they have a brand, even if it's not very good, they think, oh, we've had this brand for 20 years, people know who we are and so forth. So I want to ask the panel what they think about that dilemma of museums having established a brand but actually needing to renew it even when it's terrible. I think social media helped with some of that because some of the branding really was horrible on social media and on websites. So it forced some of the museums and art galleries to shift their, their thinking. But what's better is when they ask their community what they think and they and they kind of crowdsource it or ask, did you guys ask permission about yours? Uh, the Dallas Museum and Art Gallery, did you guys? No. no. <laughs> Sorry, we're bad. But, yeah. <laughs> but, we, were, we were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but you admitted it. That's great. Um, yeah, so I think that there's, there, there's more and more people are starting to accept that it's not working online, on digital, on technology. So they're, they're, they're being forced to change it, although it's not always easy. I think, responding to your question, there's a relation there that is curious. There is a relationship that, which is quite funny between uh, identity change 
and brand change. Because actually, these are two different things. And the repositioning or brand repositioning, well, identity changes as you change clothes. Uh, the impact is not so big. But brand change or branding is a change of your essence, what you actually are. And it has to do with your mission. And I think that we can summarize uh, along Rob's uh, comments. The most real thing, the brand, the more real in terms of its mission, the less complicated to be changed. It's not just about adjustments. For example, you were talking about uh, the lens to read the world. The brand is a lens, and you interpret the world through that lens, through that brand. Is your brand real? Does it depict what you really are, what you want to change? Does your brand reflect that? Well, the 2001 museum, when we found it, uh, was not the same as it is today. And the, the brand that combines the logotype and the discourse in terms of the space, the architecture, included the Constantino collection as the key collection as part of the whole um, museum, and in 2014, there was a change to Funda uh, Constantini Foundation, and then Malva is the Latin American Museum, and the Constantini Foundation is one of the main supporters, but it's now uh, um, in the background, and it's associated to that institutional vision. There is reluctance, and initially, the founder of the museum wondered, what do we need to change? Do we need to change the logotype? There is a strong connection with the logotype. And it seems that it's a whole problem. And in the social media, many people complain. Many people will say that they don't like what you do but or place a dislike. But three months later, they forget about everything. So you changed the identity of the branding processes at the Dallas Art Museum? So what you're asking, because <laughs> I think I can judge from your hands. So uh, no, we did change our identity in Dallas. But uh, you know, I think uh, I want to maybe pull back into what Mar was saying on one of her slides. Because my point is, you yeah. haven't changed your visual, visual identity, no, we but did. the brand shifts completely. Yes, we did. It, um, the, it, I think uh, from the gentleman's question, a good way to think about it as a museum is that we should be different first before we worry about a, a stamp or a mark or a logo. So I think when, if you go to talk to a museum about rebranding because it's clearly terrible, sometimes it's terrible because it, it doesn't represent who they already are. Sometimes it's terrible because it's unclear or confusing. Um, sometimes it's a moment where you're you're encouraging change, uh, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to boil your question down to that, which is about change. Um, and museums are they don't know which foot to put forward first. Should I make a change or should I look different first? And it's sort of you need to do it like walking and then running. And uh, so, I, but I probably agree with what Mar said. It's just be different, for act differently. If, if you're seen as uh, being elitist and snobby, then stop being snobby um, and just be friendly. And once you're friendly, then, then worry about what the logo looks like, right? And so, but I, there's a, you know, as a, a person that doesn't know how to do anything anymore, just sits in meetings all day long, it is hard to just, it's hard to know when to move. Um, and, and how to move quickly. Uh, and there's a certain amount of inertia that a museum has in and of its brand, where we feel like the brand should be forever, and it is marked in stone, and many times it's carved into the side of your building. I'm just going to jump in real quick, because yeah. this is something you guys did also. 
is also look at your mission statement because you changed it. Yeah. And you made it to reflect what you guys are actually doing currently instead of sticking with the one that was 20 years old. And it's, it's a lot shorter. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's very simple to read. It is. Which yeah. sometimes is a barrier also. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask you about planning, planning your communicational strategy. I would like to briefly know how you develop it. And in particular, I'm interested in museums where there's only two people in the communications department or there's no communications department at all. How important it is to sit get together and try to plan and design when it's the same people that have to be working on the networks, on the web page, drafting the media press articles, and getting together with visitors as well. Well, we were having a lunch discussion yesterday, and I was very happy to feel that there's many people who are working in the same chaotic way as we are doing. Before the museum got started, I started writing down many things. I wanted to be well organized, but in the midst of the process, we realized that if we do what has been said right now, it's not that you're running to do what the audience is saying, but if you're in contact with that, for example, we try to have a weekly meeting of one hour. And there's like a Persian rug in my office. And people come to the meeting, sit down, get relaxed. And we talk a lot about what's going on. Our communications strategy is all about being this in this atrium that is outdoor and watch people, listen to people, see what they are saying, see what they are complaining about see what's going on, and our directors, our director, the deputy director, they have to spend the whole weekend standing in that atrium trying to identify how people understand what we are showing or not. It's not perfect, of course, but for us, communication is all about that. It's about checking Twitter all at the same time, commenting. And although it is true that you may have an idea of what you're trying to convey as a communication message, communications change so much that you have to be constantly reading what's going on and reacting to it. Maybe that's part of what is happening today with technology. You have to react fast. Otherwise, you have no time to put together a plan and execute it. Because if you need to react quickly, or otherwise people will not remember about it. You have to be very agile, at least in our opinion. And sometimes it's a good thing to have a few people. If you're talking about a strategy, like a one-pager, this, this is what you're going to do, this is what you're not going to do. I have one for myself. I promise myself that I try not to swear online, right? <laughs> In life, Is it forget working? it, right? Yeah, yeah. But I have, I have a one pager that I, I try, I try to be positive, and if, if I'm going to do a negative, I walk away. But as far as reacting, you have to react now. That is what this medium is about, as, as far as communication is about. Um, and even I always talk about um, the, the Queen in the UK. You know, had a Facebook page and has a Twitter, and it was like you know, 15 people had to approve one thing, and it was like four days later. But then when the, the baby started being born, they were like, no, no, we got to announce this before anybody. That wasn't on their strategy. You know, so don't, don't, it's not the Bible, right? It's, it's just a piece of paper that you're going to adhere to with your own personality. And as long as you're social, you're fine. Agora, a grande questão que se coloca dentro de uma perspectiva de uma marca muito bem clara e estabelecida é que... We're talking about a clear brand. And as a result of that, the decision-making process in terms of what you're going to do and what you shouldn't do is quite complicated. The clearer the mission, as we're saying now, the clearer the brand, the easier it will be to plan or to make decisions accordingly.
Hola. Do you have any Hola. other questions, any eh, comments to share? Based on what Flor was saying in terms of timing, in terms of timing, timing for assessment, about thinking about branding, about rebranding, and how long do you need to think about a fidelization strategy in your experience? What is the assigned time to train the museum staff to introduce them to these new strategies in communication? How long did it take you to implement this? Because then it is true. Once that you're there, you ask a curator, there are other strategies, well, they respond quickly. But what about the prior preparation? Thinking about, of course, smaller museums without large communications departments where we do everything ourselves. Yeah, I'd, I'd respond to that. Yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so in terms of timing, um, there's, two, there's two things. Uh, I can tell you from our perspective to make a shift from a museum that was very closed and was somewhat hostile to the public to, to one that was open and more welcoming to the public. It took probably six months um, uh, to train a staff of about 100 people. Uh, uh, our whole staff, and we're the eighth largest museum in the US, our staff is about 250, and we have uh, three people in our marketing uh, department. Uh, but um, more important than that is that uh, I think where we've moved to and what I wanted to encourage with respect to the last question about how do you deal with all these competing priorities is just to know uh, for yourself and for your boss what's the most important thing and start doing it. Um, and rather than assuming that you'll do the work of brand transformation once or in communication once, in fact, we've seen we have to do that training, reemphasizing, addressing a question all the time consistently, continuously, and that it changes. But it, if we don't make it, if we don't turn this point of decision into a process, then we lose it and we forget about it and it goes stale. So for us anyways, uh, we have to integrate it into a process of what we do. Uh, and that, that involves distilling uh, what is maybe a list of a dozen things that must be done into just one or two priorities. So at the end of the day, you know, our communication staff do, they run Facebook, they run uh, Instagram, they tweet, they make signs for the building, they do television advertising and radio. And so every week we sit together with a very, very long list. Um, and as I said, I'm not a marketing person, but it's my job to help them know in their very, very long list, what are the two things that need to happen today and this week? Um, and that really helps. In the, um, I forget her name, Caroline, said probably now. In Imperial War Museum, what they did was start a computer classes at lunch for all of staff. And, and it, they thought like you know, two people would show up for the free biscuits. And they, they had like a list of people who, just, who, who were too shy to actually say, oh, I'm allowed to do this. But once they started the classes, it was, it was just fine. And it was a QD little thing where you know, they got stickers that they, they showed up. But it doesn't have to be a formal it, c it could be integrated in to, to what's already happening, and it doesn't have to be that and that. Acho que ainda temos tempo para uma última pergunta. Valkyria, você não vai perguntar nada. Que vergonha. Vamos lá. Bom dia. É, eu gostaria de fazer uma pergunta que concerne... Good morning. I'd like to ask a question on inclusion and sensitivity. In this panel, this, the topic of inclusion was mentioned, inclusion of unusual audiences, as Robert Stein was saying. Robert Stein mentioned museums as a hostile environment. Uh, the institutions that you represent, do you have strategies, communication strategies for, for example, blind audiences? Most communication strategies are based on visual resources. Do you have any experience that you can share with us or ideas that you can suggest in that sense? I don't work for an institution, but I believe in accessibility and inclusion. That's the best I can tell you. But I'm sure these guys can. Uh, Yo sí tengo eh, una, algunas cosas. Nosotras, por ejemplo, Brave, for example, 
we have an installed braille signing for blind people. So it's interesting that you asked this question. We do have staff, education staff, that have some pointers in terms of how to treat visually impaired people or people with other disabilities, especially people with no uh, that are blind or that are impaired. They will realize that in our museum, you can touch everything. We saw a picture of very large sculptures. Remember, well, those sculptures are washable. So this allows everybody to touch them. And we thought about something that is really cool. We want it it, it, blind people come close to the sculptures and be able to touch them and have a sense of the size because it talks about evolution. But the big surprise for us was that this was going to be their favorite section or gallery. But we realized that their favorite gallery is a gallery with 10 video screens. And when we asked them about the experience, and they tell us panorama, panorama was our favorite experience. But that's whole, wholly visual. Why did you like it? Well, because it has a soundtrack made up of nature sounds and drums. So it is highly visual, but they loved the sounds. And they described the images in Panorama based on the soundtrack. For them, this was spectacular. And never in a million years would we have thought that this was going to be their favorite room. Sometimes we're not prepared, but we learn as we go. There are certain basic things that you have to, to, to know beforehand, but sometimes it's their own experience that tells you afterwards what, what's best for them. That's how we learn as we go. The Panamarama experience, well, I'll never forget about it. OK, in the education area, we have programs for different disabilities, people with disabilities. So it's important to integrate them with the regular audiences. And as Margot was saying, try to appeal to a different sense. When you talk about blind people, you talk about visual tools, but we have different layers that are special especially focused around the smell, about around uh, hearing. So we provide experiences for these other senses, because otherwise other museums are only focused on visual, on the visual sense. In terms of the world of disabilities, I think that it is very enriching for the whole museum and for the other visitors as well. We have a this is an area that we're working on, and we're not nearly as good at serving those audiences as we would like to be. But we have a strategy that has worked well in a few cases. And it generally goes like this. We will form a relationship with a community uh, that has different needs in the museum than the general member of the public. So maybe it's a visually impaired people, or we have um, uh, some great programming for children with autism, uh, for adults with Alzheimer's, uh, uh, for e even things that are more, un more unusual, people with uh, phobias about being outside, right? Uh, so we'll work with those communities in smaller groups where we'll invite them to come to the museum. For our autism programs, many of the children have are troubled uh, by overstimulation, and they don't like the large crowds in the museum. So we invite them on a Saturday morning to come, and we design the museum specifically to meet their needs. Uh, and that works fine, uh, but is only really possible in, in very small groups. Uh, what we try to do, what we're trying to get better at, is to use those small groups to learn about uh, more universal design aspects that we could take maybe from uh, something that benefits children with autism that would also benefit the general public uh, and then apply those universal designs to the experience for everyone in the museum. And then we try, uh, we're trying to, for every program that we work with the blind or hearing impaired or uh, mentally impaired in some way, we try to create a, a, what we call an on-ramp 
Uh, so we're trying to equip them for coming to the museum on their own and making the museum respond to things that they would need to do that. So right now it's a process of learning for us. We're not nearly as good at it as we would want to be, but this idea of serving the audience in a small way, learning from them, and applying that learning to the overall general audience is a great, has been a good model for us. It's about listening to your community and seeing what their needs are and acting upon it. Back to that little screen. <laughs> Muito bem, então vamos encerrar. Eu acho que podemos concluir que, dentro da perspectiva de que tudo no museu comunica, é... Everything in the museum is communicating something. So it is clear that we understand that what defines a museum is not its visual identity. It's not this, the signs. It's not the Facebook page, but it's attitude. The attitude is in training the staff, in developing sensitivity towards specific communities, in our positioning in social networks. We're closing the session. Thank you very much, and thank you to the speakers.